In section 8.3, I'm going to do an example featuring an object in a non-inertial reference frame, and I will do my best. No, no let's try it. In section 8.3, I'm going to do an example. In section 8.3, I'm going to do an example of an object in a non-inertial reference frame. In section 8.3, I'm going to do an example of an object in a non-inertial reference frame. I'll then define an inertial. In section 8.3, I'm going to do an example of an object in a non-inertial reference frame. I'll then go on to define non-inertial reference frames and briefly discuss what happens in them. In this example, we have a pendulum that's hanging from the ceiling of a braking car. There's a 1.5 kilogram bob on the pendulum that takes the position as shown in the figure below. And we need to find the tension in the string and we need to find the car's acceleration. So like we normally do, I'm gonna draw a free body diagram showing the forces acting on the pendulum bob. There's gonna be the weight force acting down. There's gonna be tension acting along the string. And because that tension force acts at an angle, I'll need to resolve it into its components. We can then take the uh, components and uh, redraw them and translate into a right triangle and use this to find all the necessary uh, unknowns. So to start with, we know that the forces in the y direction have to be balanced. There's no motion vertically, so the vertical forces, Ty, and the weight have to be in balance. And we can calculate what that weight force is by multiplying the mass times g. We're given the mass as one and a half, G it has a value of 10, so Ty is going to have a value of 15 newtons. We're given the angle with the Y axis. We know the side adjacent to that, so we can determine the other two sides of the triangle using right triangle trick. We can relate the adjacent side to the hypotenuse with cosine. The cosine of 21 degrees will then be the adjacent side, which is 15 newtons, divided by the hypotenuse, which is the tension. And we can then algebraically manipulate this to solve for the tension force. And when we plug these numbers into the calculator, we end up getting 16 newtons for the tension. We can then calculate the X component of the tension force. The X component uh, of the tension force is opposite this 21 degree angle. The tangent function relates the opposite and adjacent sides. The opposite side is what we're looking for, Tx. The adjacent side to the angle is uh, Ty, which we determined to be 15. We can then rearrange this to solve for Tx. It will be 15 times the tangent of 21 degrees or 5.73 newtons. We're going to use this value, Tx, to calculate the acceleration. The acceleration occurs in the x direction. Therefore, the net force is just the sum of all the forces in the x direction. There is only one force in the x direction. We can determine the acceleration by dividing the net force, which we know is the same as Tx, divided by the mass. I can fill in the numbers. The mass was given as one and a half kilograms. And this will give us a value for the acceleration as 3.82 meters per second squared.
Now this problem has something uh, significant and a little bit weird here because there's two ways that we can view this. We can view this from the side of the road. And if we were viewing it from the side of the road uh, in a location outside the car, well, then we see the pendulum experience an unbalanced net force backwards, which caused a backwards acceleration. That's what we should expect to happen. This cause and effect uh, of a backwards acting force causing a backwards acceleration is consistent with Newton's laws. However, if you were riding in the car, what does it look like there? Well, there it looks like the object's at rest. The pendulum bob is just moving straight along with you. So from the perspective of somebody riding in the car, we have an object that's at rest, and yet there's an unbalanced force in the x direction. And that's not supposed to happen. The law of inertia is not valid from this perspective. And perspectives where the law of inertia does not hold are referred to as non-inertial reference frames. Reference frames where the law of inertia does hold are referred to as inertial. And most of the uh, problems that we're going to do are going to be involving uh, objects in inertial reference frames. But because you, uh, you will occasionally experience non-inertial reference frames, it's a good thing to quickly discuss. It seems like there's some force pushing the pendulum bob forward from the perspective of somebody in the car. And what is that force? Well, there is no actual force pushing the bob forward. It just seems like there's a force pushing forward. And anybody that's ridden in a car while it's braking uh, has had that experience where you feel like there's a force pushing you forward uh, when in fact there is not. And so we refer to that feeling as a fictitious force. Sometimes you'll see that called a pseudo force. So what is a non-inertial reference frame? Well, a reference frame is described as being non-inertial if it accelerates or if it rotates. And an observer in a, in a non-inertial reference frame uh, is going to have experiences where it seems like there's some fictitious force acting on objects, uh, but there is no actual interaction uh, to cause this force. It just seems like there's a force. Now, the fictitious force that's, that, that, that's not really there, just seems like it is, is always going to be equal in magnitude and opposite in, in direction to the net force acting on the object. And I'm going to give you some examples here. If you're in a car and the car accelerates quickly forward, then you feel like you are getting pushed back into your seat. There is no force pushing you back into your seat. It's just because the car is accelerating forward. The net force is forward, and so you feel like there's a force pushing you back. The car is non-inertial because it's accelerating. We'll get to this uh, in more detail in a later unit, but if you're in a reference frame that is rotating, you're going to feel as though there's an outward force pushing you out away from the center of the circle. And we call this a centrifugal force. There is no, there is no force that pushes you out. Really, there has to be a force that pulls you in. But we'll get to that in more detail in a later chapter. Here's one that we're going to discuss in a little more detail right now. Uh, it's not going to come up in any more detail throughout the year, but it is really interesting and it's kind of famous. Uh, if you are in a rotating reference frame and you're looking at another object that's moving, it seems like that object is going to curve opposite the direction of the uh, rotation of your frame. And you can see it here in the little animation that uh, in the top animation, we're viewing this from a inertial reference frame. And there's no force acting on the ball that's rolling on this rotating platform. And so it moves in a straight line, just like we would expect it to. But if you view this uh, from the perspective of a uh, point that is uh, rotating on that disc, like the little uh, marked red circle, uh, then it seems as though the, uh, the ball 
that is in fact moving straight is curving. It's just from the perspective of a uh, of an observer that's in a rotating reference frame. And we call this effect a Coriolis force, but really there's no force causing this. It's just from the uh, rotation of the reference frame itself. And uh, you're going to see this in a little more detail in, in, uh, in a demo video that you're going to see on the next slide. Most problems that we do in physics use the Earth as a reference frame. Is that a good one to make me uh, measurements from? Well, the Earth is rotating, so it's non-inertial. So it seems like there's going to be forces acting on objects uh, on Earth's surface. However, the effects of the Earth's rotation, what we refer to as the Coriolis force, are really, really small. And and so we don't usually notice them. The only times that we notice them are for very large systems where the Coriolis force can have a combined effect uh, of, of acting on lots of things like lots of air particles that account for uh, weather. And what we see is that it makes the, uh, makes the, the, the weather systems uh, swirl in a certain way. And you can see that in weather systems from the uh, shot from space. Here you can see a hurricane that's occurring uh, off the coast of Cuba. You can see Cuba in the, in the photo. You can see the southern tip of Florida. And what I'd like you to notice is that hurricanes, uh, in the, which, which only take place in the northern hemisphere, are going to rotate uh, counterclockwise. The cousin to the hurricane is the cyclone, and cyclones are just the southern hemisphere version of a hurricane. And here you can see some cyclones off the coast of Australia. And what I'd like you to notice here is that the cyclones, uh, they, they rotate in the opposite direction. They rotate clockwise. And uh, this, this effect is kind of famous because you can see this in your house because the water going down a drain is very, very sensitive. And so this Coriolis force can actually be seen in, uh, in water going down a drain. In the northern hemisphere, water going down a drain is going to swirl in a counterclockwise uh, rotation. And in the southern hemisphere, the, uh, the water going down a drain actually swirls the opposite way. So for most, uh, for most of our purposes, we can neglect the fact that the Earth is rotating. And for everyday phenomenon, we can act as though the Earth is inertial. And I would like to show you as, uh, as a demonstration a really neat video uh, showing, how, uh, showing how the Coriolis force does, in fact, change the direction uh, uh, of, of uh, water going down a drain in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere. Yeah, one, two, and three. Look at this. Down. So it's a real proof yes. that we are really in the center. Don't wear boots. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now let's go to the south. <laughs> <laughs> 
sparkling water. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, and three. Go once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little example, okay? Now let's go to the And you go to the Mr. north. Mr. Wizard. Yeah, go to the north and I'll go the other way around, yeah? Mr. On a related note, we said that the rotation of the Earth is what causes the Coriolis force. But how do we know that the Earth is in fact rotating? How do we know that uh, the Earth isn't still in space with the whole universe rotating around the, uh, the Earth, which is what people used to think uh, pre-science? Well, uh, there's an observation that somebody made uh, that a pendulum is going to swing back and forth in the same plane. Swings back and forth until it runs out of energy and comes to rest. But that plane is going to appear to rotate uh, according to an observer that is rotating. Uh, is rotating. And so what uh, do we see pendulums um, swing back and forth in the same plane on the surface of the earth or do we see them rotate? Uh, as the as the day goes on, well, uh, a pendulum on the Earth is going to rotate, which proves that the Earth is rotating, and uh, we can demonstrate this through something called a Foucault pendulum. Um, what it is, it's basically just a really large pendulum, so that it has lots of energy, and it takes uh, the better part of a day for it to run out of energy. And you can see these set up at uh, several science museums uh, throughout the world. And they usually set something up on the outside. In this case, you'll see little blocks, and some of the blocks you can see have been knocked down. That's because over the course of the day, the, the, um, the swinging back and forth of this pendulum rotates and uh, throughout the day you'll see the the blocks get uh, get knocked over